Well, um, I think uh, I think that's actually a pretty good place to begin. No, uh, talking about um, your experience being around your dad during the making of the film, because um, you were what you were like thirteen or fourteen at the time. Uh, yeah, twelve, yeah. thirteen. Yeah. So, um, so I don't know. Could you could you just like elaborate on what that whole what that whole experience was like? Yeah, I mean, given what the film is like, it must have been an incredibly singular set, uh, really you know wild production. So, can you what can you tell us? Well, my dad had just made a film called Watermelon Man for, uh, cool. for Columbia Pictures. And the, the film crew was all white male, basically. And he was really, um, he was very firm that he wanted the film crew to reflect America. And at the time, the only way you could do a film non-union in Hollywood was if it was an X-rated film. They would leave what they call smut films alone. So he made it under the guise of making an X-rated movie. And that's how he was able to pull it off. So I was a kid on the set, and, um, you know, it's a film about a, a sex worker who, you know, sort of goes from a me mentality to a we mentality. And when he uh, was doing the scene with the sex worker, one of the guys in the film who was watching it was Melvin's dad, my, my grandfather. Max, did you see him there? Did you notice him? That was Granddad. Yeah. So <laughs> he brought Grand. I mean, it was all hands on deck. Yeah. Um, you know, so it was when you grow up on a family farm, you learn how to feed the chickens, uh, plow the North 40, take care of the horses. It's all a part of the Zen of farming. And when, as Max and Marguerite can tell you, when you grow up uh, in the Van Peebles family, you learn a little about editing, bookkeeping, accounting, carrying cables, acting, it's all a part of the Zen of filmmaking. And, and it doesn't mean that you'll end up in film, per se, but you will have a, a work ethic. And, and Dad would make sure that if your last name was Van Peebles, you worked for the family discount, you came early, you left late, you would not be the weak link. Um, as a kid, honestly, I was aware of the, the battles, but not the overall war. Mm. You know, I, I, I understood little things but I didn't really get the big picture of what he did until later on. And there were actual death threats on his life. Uh, he broke the unions. They started hiring people of color, started hiring more women. <laughs> so there was some blowback with that, obviously. Uh, this is pre-MAGA world, but you can imagine what that looked like back then. Um, one of the things that I, was, uh, I found very interesting was there was a reviewer who reviewed the movie I think it was with the New York Times, since we're in New York, it's appropriate. And he wrote that, that not only was Mr. Van Peebles' movie flawed, and it was based on a premise that, you know, was, was sort of like modern science fiction and that these police officers would beat up this unarmed black guy, uh, and that just didn't happen in America. Uh, and, and he said not only was that flawed, but... You couldn't even hear the dialogue. You couldn't understand the words. All the dialogue was garbled. And so my father called him up, and he said, listen, I'm not asking you to change your review, but I challenge you to come see it in the community. Come see it in the black community. And much to his credit, he went up there, and he watched the film in Harlem. And suddenly he was there with people that understood every word. And, and he... He just didn't speak ebonics, right? And w but the problem is when you're, you know, when you're a member of the dominant culture, and every SAT kit test is geared to you, and you know the legal system is geared to you, and all the guys on the money sort of look like you or you with cooler hair, uh, you can't conceive of a second America. So there's a real blind spot for the folks who were members of the dominant culture back then, because. If a black uh, reviewer wrote, saw something and it, they didn't, it didn't make sense, they would say, you know, maybe I didn't understand it. But a white reviewer would say it didn't work. Mm -hmm. The concept that there could be a whole nother America was absolutely foreign to people. Now it's not. Now people, you know, every kid at the mall has got his hat backwards and, you know, you know is listening to hip hop and <laughs> probably using the N-word when he can. So, you know, now we're, we're more aware of it, but back then there was no, the, the, the dominant culture was at a complete loss. And so, um, and so was Hollywood. Yeah. 
And here's the thing. Is that okay if I tell you this? Yeah. <laughs> so what was happening contextually is, is that, um, you know, after the death of King and Malcolm, and, and the riots in the, you had 68, you, America was burning, man. America was not in a laughing mood. And so you had Watts, you had Detroit. Uh, a lot of cities were burning. And so basically you had the start of white flight. So white folks were like, yo, we're getting out of the city and we're going to the suburb. And what that meant was that these movie theaters, which were huge, elegant theaters, were like empty barns. And the movie industry was suffering. They couldn't figure out how to get people back to the movies because you had white flight. They were like, and they hadn't invented the, the cineplex, you know, with all the multi blah, blah, blah that they have in the suburbs now. And so MGM was losing money. They sold off their back lot. MGM was selling off Dorothy's red slippers. The, the, Hollywood was in the toilet, man. And so when Melvin made this movie, they, they were saying they were making black movies, but Melvin said, you're not making movies that black folks want to see. You know, so it's, it's just, you're, 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 you're leaving money on the table. So when he made Sweetback, and it killed it at the box office, it became the top grossing independent hit of all time up to that point. It made about $15 million at a dollar a ticket. So that's like $150 million today. Hollywood was like, oh shit. Well, we don't want Melvin. He's a little radical. We don't want Melvin. But we want some of that radical black money. And so what they did was they had a, a script um, by a, a white writer, a couple right white writers about a detective. And they took that and they cast it in blackface and they called it Shaft. And they noticed Men Melvin's formula was to get on radio with Earth, Wind & Fire, who did the music. And so they got this really talented young brother from Stax Records named Isaac Hayes. He was 24 years old. And they brought him in to do the soundtrack for Shaft. And after that, they, uh, they did Superfly. And so that's when sort of the, the golden era of, of black exploitation was born in that it was the Hollywood system said without Melvin, without his you know, revolutionary message, we want to take that formula. We're going to have the same icing, you know, empowered black lead with cool cool music and cool facial hair, uh, but we will drain out the revolutionary message. So the, the Black Panthers pointed out that Sweetback goes up against the system, challenges the status quo. He goes up against the man with the help of a white guy, a Mexican guy in the desert, oh, some women, uh, these sort of all the lumpen proletariat. Melvin was a big fan of Brecht, and he, he liked to sort of see what the, the beauty in the common man. And so the Panthers wrote that Sweetback went up against the system. Shaft, being a private detective, worked in collusion with the system. Big difference. And Superfly dealt drugs against his own people for the system. And that was more hurtful in the long run because it made being a drug dealer hip. So whereas they said Sweetback made being a revolutionary hip, we get down to being, making a drug dealer look, look hip. Um, so, you know, that, that's what happened. But I think, you know, for kids growing up, we didn't really process, you know, as a, as a kid seeing Shaft and Superfly and or Sweetback, we didn't always process the political message. The main thing we saw was black folks were starting to look sexy and win and weren't waiting on tables anymore. And, and, and so we saw that whole thing. And for a folk that you know, have been told that God doesn't look like them, Santa Claus doesn't look like them, no one on the money looks like them, even the Easter Bunny is white. Seeing imagery that shows you winning and kicking some ass versus being the Motisa class is a tonic. That's a long ass answer to, that's my blue book answer. <laughs> no, it's a perfect answer. Like, Shut up! <laughs> no, man, they don't want to hear from me. Uh, um, yeah, but, uh, but I also, so I also want to like, um, I want to talk a little bit about about uh, looking at the film now in 2021, and you know, um, obviously this restoration is going to occasion a lot of people to look at Sweet Sweetback's badass song now and think about it in terms of today. And I'm just I'm just curious in the course of your like uh, helping out with the restoration, your approval of it, and like um, and in looking at the film now, just kind of like what sorts of uh, reflections or impressions you're sort of getting about maybe kind of like where Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song kind of fits into, fits into everything today. Because I think it, you know, I think there's a lot there, but it, maybe it's kind of complicated. 
Yeah, it's 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 a trip, man. Um, it's still a real hard hitting film. I mean, you you got the opening frame with with me playing the kid. I'd like another shot at that role now. Uh, you know, you get the opening shot with the kid kid young sweetback losing his virginity. Then you go right to the whole sex worker thing, you know, and it's a male sex worker, which is interesting, you know, so uh, it's some van people's sex exploitation shit, I guess. You know, if you're gonna exploit somebody, exploit yourself, right? Um, uh, and then you get into the whole thing with this sort of, you know, with the, with the kid that gets beat up by the cops, you know, so it's, again, it, I'm, 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 I'm there's a French saying, uh, le plus ça change, la plus ça reste la même. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And I say, you know, as someone else said, that history doesn't always directly repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And it's interesting that we're now way more aware of the George Floyds of it and the Rodney Kings of it. But back then, this is, my dad said, before the video, there was the movie. Before the video of Rodney King, there was the movie of this. And if you lived in white America, you really this would be like modern science fiction. You'd be like, what the hell is this about? You know, but, but when we saw it, I remember my dad talked about a screening of Sweetback when he went to see it. I was up in Harlem and there was a little black lady uh, who had come from church and somehow ended up, and I don't know how this chick came from church with one of them little hats with a flower in it, you know, the blue hair. And she was there watching the film. And when Sweetback's running through the desert, she said, oh, Lord, let him die, let him die. Let him, and, he, and my, my, my dad was like, why does she want him to die? And it, because in those days, if you stood up against the man or the lynch mob or anything, you had to die. The, the, you would not live. And so the concept that the brother would stand up against the system, get away, and, and leave that remark on the screen was unfathomable. And so it was just a mind blower in, in so many ways. And, it, and it's, I'm still, you know, knowing dad like we do, we just know dad does the shit. <laughs> he does some crazy shit. And he does the stuff he wants to say. And he, he really is an unstoppable cat. I mean, even today, I was watching the film sitting out there going, you know, it's, it's a rough ass movie. It really is. Um, I think what, what, what they caught with the restoration is it's still gritty. It still looks the way he wanted it to look. It doesn't look, you know, it doesn't look glossy and, and, and homogenized yeah. at all. It's still got all the 70s grit <laughs> that he wanted. Um, you know, dad's, dad's a real, he's a badass cat. He's a character and he made the movie he wanted to make. Um, and then, you know, I said, dad, I, and after that, by the way, he didn't get job offers after that, which is really interesting. Because typically, if you make a hit movie, you get offers. But I said, I said, Dad, how come we didn't get any offers after that? He goes, son, if you go into a pool hall and you pretend that you can't play pool and all the big guys bet against you and you take their money and then you whoop ass and you play pool, you can't play the same game in the same pool hall ever again. <laughs> and that's why he came to Broadway and came to New York, was that Hollywood was, Hollywood was dead. And they were like, we don't want that. We want it, we'll, we'll go with the, the, the icing on the cake, but we're not gonna have that revolutionary message. And you know, it's a weird thing because it's sort of similar with rap, right? My dad does Ain't Supposed to Die on Natural Death, which is sort of, you know, Brecht meets spoken word, you know? And, uh, and sort of is credited with sort of being also the godfather of rap by Gil Scott Heron and the last poets, you know, and the last poets who start to rap about the revolution will not be televised. So initially, Rap had a, 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 a potency to it, right? It had something to say. But as when they, and even Curtis Blow, you know, these are the breaks, you know, when he's saying, you know, on white lines and some of the stuff folks were rapping about conditions, even NWA, you'd rather see me in a pen than me and Lorenzo rolling in a benzo, right? But what happens is when big money gets in it and the corporation or the corpses, as Amiri Baraka refers to them, get into it, they kill the revolutionary message. So eventually, rap becomes just nursery rhymes to a great beat about, I got, I'm Gucci man, or I'm wearing more gold than you, and it becomes absolutely counter-revolutionary. 
And so the rappers sort of inherit the bravado of the Black Panthers and the bravado of Malcolm without the political ideology. Deliberately so, because now you're feeding it to the masses and you've, you've inadvertently, mistakenly substituted freedom for money. Right? Malcolm says, freedom by any means necessary. And later on, someone's saying, get paid by any means necessary. And so, as Paul Robinson says, when you buy into the zeitgeist and the paradigm, the virtues, the values of a people who would buy and sell you as a people, what have you become? And so what happens is where a sweetback escapes the, across the desert and doesn't look fly, he's got on some rough-ass boots and he's all dirty and he's, he's almost said, fuck you to materialism and left that whole gold look back with that. The other movies continued it. And so what it subtextually, I think, does is it, it perpetuates capitalism. Sweetback questions capitalism and questions the status quo. It says, hey, let's take a look at all this. Let's look at, look at all this, as the Panthers did. But the other movies become sort of, to some degree, commercials. And it's sort of like, well, the only thing wrong with capitalism, the only answer to capitalism is we need black capitalism. There's nothing inherently wrong with money. We just need more money in black hands, which is a, which, which is a thought. But... But it, it, it doesn't ever question the system. And, and my, my thing is, I think that I believe, and this is me, not my dad, I believe that it's actually one of the last conversations I had with my dad before he passed was, I think there's a direct connection between racism is right around the corner from sexism, sexism is right around the corner from classism, lookism, and then the wholesale destruction of mother nature. What I mean by that? If you're willing to exploit over race and repress over race, you're probably going to exp exp uh, repress your woman over gender and then over class and eventually you exploit mother nature herself. And so if you buy into that capitalistic bully mentality with no consciousness to it, you, it leads to a genocide and we're all in it. Dr. King says we all learn to live together as brothers and sisters or we perish together as fools. And I add to that now, we learn to live together as brothers and sisters in harmony with nature or perish together as fools. So I thought that when I talked to dad about it, I said, Sweetback was that first shot across the bow saying, no, stop, question the system. Then from them, black folks get the right to vote, women get the right to vote, now you can love who you want to love, and we got to get right with nature. So it, it, it comes in specific steps. You had the, the black revolution, the women's revolution, you know, and, 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 the, and the gay revolution after that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I think we, d we definitely want to hear from the audience. So if you have, uh, if you have questions, uh, please uh, get ready to come up to the microphone. I'll ask one more maybe, and then we'll, we'll cool. throw it over to them. Um, so you, you, you alluded to your film uh, Badass earlier, in which you, you're, you know, it portrays like the, you know, the sort of production history of uh, Sweet Sweetback, and, and, and you're playing your father in, uh, in the film. So I was, I mean, it just seemed appropriate to kind of ask you a little bit about the exper about the, that whole experience. And I'm especially interested in kind of considering you were there. I imagine you still did some sort of research, you know, to 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 sort of piece it all together. Could you just tell us a bit about how that all kind of all that came together, and what and what that was like for you, um, and and what and what your dad thought of the whole. Enter enterprise well you know i growing up yeah I, initially i didn't like the motherfucker that much right <laughs> i ain't gonna lie max knows this but but there, you know the song a boy named sue there's a great country western song where this i think it's johnny cash i believe it's johnny cash where he, he's he's a boy named sue and his father left and but named him sue and he sings about how he became a gunfighter because he people in school picked on him so much calling him Sue that he had to become tough and fight. And eventually he says, I'm going to track down my dad. I'm going to shoot his ass. He tracks down his father. Finally, he finds the guy at the bar, sitting at the bar. And, and he comes up to his father and the father says, I guess you come to kill me. <laughs> and he says, well, before you kill me, I want to tell you something. I knew I wouldn't be around and I knew you'd have to be tough to survive. So I figured the best thing I could do before I split was to name you Sue. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd have to fight. I, I knew I wanted to work in film early on. And, you know, my dad had kept saying, you know, show business is business, learn the business side. Um, he wasn't always the easiest cat to work with, obviously. Uh, he would say, you know, you can't win a war with white gloves on. But every time I followed him, every time I 
tried to do it myself, I realized how much he had taught me. And there's a great quote by Mark Twain where he says, all my life my father was an idiot, at 21 he was a genius. And so I, the more I followed him down the path and, and, and to that, I, the more I realized, wow, to do what he did back then, man, and it, it, and it, was, it related directly to me. I mean, I, I don't know if you folks know, but I made my first, my dad made his movie Sweet back in 1971. 20 years later, there were kids that, like Spike Lee and Julie Dash and John Singleton and Mario Van Peebles, that saw those movies, the movies he did and that Ozzy did and Gordon did. And we said, yeah, we want to do that. And I was one of those kids. And because they did that, because Melvin kicked the door in, I was able to make New Jack City. So I, thank you. So I made New Jack inside the system Thanks to Melvin. I, I, when he made Sweetback, I don't think he ever thought that the kid with the afro was going to be you know, doing, doing something similar later, and let alone, a couple years after that, playing him in a movie. So I go to see my dad. Let me tell you this story. I go to see Pop. He's got the cigar. He doesn't really light him. He sort of chews him. I go to see him because he's got a book on the making of Sweetback. I thought a little flattery would be a good way in and, I, you know, and, and maybe the promise of money. And I said, you know, Dad, I would, I would thinking of that your book, your, your making of Sweetback is an incredible tale. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And um, I would like to uh, consider making a film of it. Huh. Uh-huh. Huh. And um, I'd like to option your book. Who's going to play me? Uh, I, I started listing some people, and he came down. And he said, um, you do it. You play me. But I have one note. Don't make me too fucking nice. And that was his only note, and he sold me the, the rights to the book for a dollar. Of course, there was an option. It was Sunclass Set Clause, because it's dad. So it means if I don't make the movie within a year, he gets the rights back. <laughs> but that's dad. And um, he never came to the set. He had no comments until the, you know, if I have one shot of him at the end. Um, and uh, I think I followed his note. And it was really interesting for me as a kid to, for me as an adult, to play his side of the chessboard against what would have been my side back in the day. And I, ha I hired someone else to play me. And it was uh, psychotherapy on celluloid, brother. Yeah, yeah. It really was to relive that stuff. Um, and, you know, we kind of did the way. He made Sweet back in, uh, I think, 18 days. I made my film in about 18 days. He wrote it, directed it, produced it, acted in it. I did the same with it. But I didn't have to go non-union. No one was shooting at me. <laughs> no one arrested my crew like they did. Yeah. All these things because Melvin Van Peebles had gone first. Yeah. And when I did Sweetback, part of it was, was that I was like, there's a tendency we look at Hollywood and go, okay, these things are getting whitewashed and they're telling the story differently. And we know, you know, karate is a martial art invented by the Asians, but Hollywood's not going to let the karate kid be Asian. We sort of accept that. We know the heavyweights look like Ali and Tyson, but Hollywood's not going to make them look like Ali and Tyson. They'll probably make them look closer to Stallone, and those movies are great. I love Rocky. Uh, but we get sort of people of color become sort of exotic backdrop, and the dominant culture inserts itself in a very dominant way, and we sort of become that other. And it happens with film history. There was a great book on independent film, I think, Easy Riders and... Easy Riders, Raging Bulls. Totally. Yeah. And they leave Melvin out. He's not in it at all. I mean, the top grossing independent in the hit of that time. And he's left out of the history as told by a white guy. And no disrespect to Ryan Seacrest. Love me some Ryan Seacrest. But he got a star on Hollywood Boulevard. And Melvin doesn't. <laughs> it's, it's a mind blower. You go, wait a minute, this is Hollywood Boulevard. Who changed Hollywood? <laughs> you know? Melvin did. And yet, you know, it's like... You know, so you kind of see that and you go, wow. And, I, and then I, you know, so it was, but, you know, it doesn't surprise me. There, there's a great bit where Malcolm X says, I love Dr. King, 
I respect Dr. King, but I don't understand Dr. King because he's speaking nonviolence to an enemy that doesn't speak nonviolence. And they said, well, what do you mean by that, uh, Mr. Malcolm X? And he said, well, case in point. He said, look, if we're playing football, right, we're playing against the opposite team, and the opposite team wants to give our quarterback the MVP award, we got to wonder what the hell is going on. <laughs> so if you're waiting for the dominant culture to reward you or give you a gold statue or whatever it is, got to say, wait, <laughs> wait a minute, why is the opposite team giving us that? And so it doesn't surprise me, yeah, it doesn't surprise me when they don't give Melvin a star. It doesn't surprise me when they leave him out of a book. But I just said, as long as I'm a filmmaker and I'm above ground and I have a little bit of juice and wherewithal, I want to make that movie. And so that was a bigger thing to say, hey, man, uh, you've told your story, which has been history, because you guys write history. History is a book written by the winner. And clearly the Native Americans and black Americans and women, and there are a lot of folks that aren't the winner in history. Look at the back of the $2 bill and you'll see what I'm saying. But this time, we will. And so I did it like Dad, and I, and I wanted to take that back. Yeah. So um, why don't we, why don't we uh, take a couple audience questions? Yeah, in line with the uh, revolutionary aspect of all you're talking about, I think that there was something really subversive about Mel doing s stuff like a, a book about Becky, um, Becky Sharp you know, a Thatcher story, or three-day pass. I mean, there's a, like, universal, uh, but at the same time, revolutionary in, in their own way, you know? And it's, that's, like, truly artistic, that you can take things like that and make a lesson without, uh, like, under the wire. Do you know what I mean? I was wondering if you could comment on that at all. Well, you, you hit something... Wow, I was yelling before. I'm, I don't have to yell. You guys can hear me fine. Shit, I'm sorry. I was yelling in your ears. Um, Dad talked about something, and Max and I have had this conversation, my brother Max over there hiding out under the hat. And that was, he, he thought about a lot about the right to be ordinary. That, you know, Dr. King's dream was not just that the talented 10th could make it, the Spikes, the Obamas, the... Van Peebles, the Jacksons, but that the average brother or sister could make it like the average white guy can make it. And so he said, he, he, was, he wrote this thing and he was often, if you look at it, the people that he focused on were not always doctors and lawyers and, you know, people at the top of their game. This is a sex worker. This is an average Joe. This is a this is an average woman, even three day past. It's not, you look at Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, very well, lovely film, and, and Poitier is so overqualified. He's a doll, he's a doctor, he's, and he's dating a shopkeeper, but there's an equivalency because he's black and she's white. Whereas you look at three day past, they're both just human and fumbling and sort of, it's like a bittersweet love story. So I, th I think he was, I think he was interested in seeing the beauty of the real us, not just the, the glamorized, otherized us. And that if you, if you otherized success, to some degree, you removed it from yourself. You removed it from the possibility of you doing it, right? But if you made it someone that you go, oh, this is a flawed cat, or a flawed woman, and they're regular folk like me, then somehow you made their achievements more achievable. And, you know, that in itself is revolutionary. I think, you know, he, he started writing books like, uh, and, and wrote the play The Champagne, where the lead character is Bessie Smith, and he posited that between Jack Johnson's reign as the first heavyweight champ with the, I think it was 11, uh, no, I think it was 11 or, I forget how many years, that after that they wouldn't let a black fighter fight for the title and then until Joe Lewis, the Braun Bomber. And what he posited was that in between, Bessie Smith was the uncrowned heavyweight champion of the world. And, and, and he, he would write about people that he was intrigued by. Same thing, if you see his play Ain't Supposed to Die a Natural Death, it's a regular brother pushing a cart on a street or a homeless cat. It's not, it's not the people who live up in 
the ivory towers. And I think, um, I think th those were the things that moved him, the story of the common man, the lumpen proletariat. Yeah. So the thing that I noticed a lot during the film was the depiction of a sort of blurring of gender roles a lot in the movie with the fact that like during the sex show it started as a woman wearing a man's outfit with the fake beard and all that and then she was turned by the fairy godmother a man in a dress into <laughs> Sweetback and I thought that was a really interesting depiction of that and then later with the men in the mascara at the truck stop I just think that's a really interesting idea. You were mentioning before the kind of line between racism and sexism and classism and all that. I think it's really cool that this film managed to show that kind of progressiveness so far back, 50 years ago. I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, I, th I think you got it in that they were all the downtrodden. These are all the people that Norman Rockwell never painted, right? These are all the folks that, that are marginalized. You know, Dad and I talked about, you know, America did, Hollywood made more Westerns than any other genre of Western, right? And in Westerns, the, the black guy was sort of a shuffling character who rolled his eyes. The, if there was an Asian guy, he was sort of the deferential houseboy hop sing. If there was a Hispanic guy, he was the oily bandit who didn't need no stinking badges. And if there was a woman, she was sort of uh, pale and frail and needed rescuing. And if there was a Native American, well, you know how that ended. And they would say, no, nothing, no Indian but a dead Indian. So across the board, all people of color and, and a different gender were marginalized. And so when we talked about doing Sweetback, he wanted to do, take a hat almost like from a Western. And... You know, then I, we wound up doing a Western after that. We, I did a Western called Posse with my dad. But, but he was conscious of, these are all the folks that you don't see that are part of the fabric of this country. Um, and uh, we're going to put them on the big screen. And if you could see yourself as dominant in a future film, could you see yourself, could you conceive of yourself as dominant in a, in a business industry? And is maybe political realm and I would posit that the, 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 the first thing you have to understand is that modern day capitalists don't put the chains on your body you know the Franz Fanon says the, the colonizers leave behind the schools and the churches to colonize the socialize, to socialize the oppressed to the oppressor's point of view and if you add to that movies and television You've been sold, we've been sold commercials of what beauty looks like and what, what aesthetics to ascribe to and what rules to ascribe to for so long that it's, it's hard for us to really separate ourselves out anymore and not know, hey, was that a commercial that was sold to me or is that really me? And the first step to breaking that is claiming your own imagery. And, and so this was a first step to breaking it. And that's a really astute, no one's ever asked me that question before. Thank you. And this will be our last question right here. So. Oh, I'm going to make a long-ass answer then. <laughs> yeah. <You> <laughs> yeah, settle in. Hi. Um, this is my first time seeing the movie. Um, I told my brother, and he was like, yo, I never saw that, so let me, let me, let me know how it is after. Um, when you mentioned the church lady that went to see the movie, I was thinking of my grandparents, who are church ladies as well, and I can't see them seeing the movie, so I'm curious what what the feedback was from the church community or just the black community in general who may have just been like shocked by the subject? Right, that's a great question. Well, so first of all, you know, I can take this off now. Um, first of all, like any other community, we're, mo we're not monolithic, right? So there's no one person that can really say, I'm speaking for black people. But man, it was the whole spectrum. <laughs> you know, it was the whole spectrum. Um, some folks were outraged. Some folks, you know, like the Panthers loved it. Um, you know, and Melvin said, well, I'm doing my job. You know what I mean? I've, I'm, I'm doing my job. And again, when he was in France, one of the things that he'd said, I mean, you, you, again, you had Rome was burning, man, and people were playing golf. You know, like I said, we were killing the Kennedys. We did all, you know, Detroit's burning, Chicago's burning. And as he put it, America was not in a laughing mood. And yet, 
artistically and musically, we were still, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, why don't bur-, you know, doing that kind of stuff. So he's like, I'm not seeing any of this reflected in our music. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, the closest thing was really Bob Dylan, do you know what I mean? Who was saying some of it. And so there were, not, there were gonna still be folks who thought, no, let's try to be colored. Malcolm was saying, you can't pray your way to freedom, F that, you know. <laughs> you, you, it's not going to work. They've been kicking your ass for 400 years. They're just getting better at it. So the, the black community was, man, it was, it was divided as to how to react to it. Um, you know, they were coming after uh, Bobby Seale and Huey. My dad had buttons that, that, you know, that he put on his Brer album cover said, Free Huey. They were killing Fred Hampton. They were wiping the Black Panthers out. By the way, I don't know if you know, my father and I did the movie on the Black Panthers. Uh, called Panther, and it's, it's almost impossible to get, but if you can find it, it is really worth seeing. Uh, he wrote it, and uh, I directed it, and we both produced it together. So, you know, there were, there were schools of thought that said, no, we should just continue to, you know, ch- hope that they recognize our humanity, and other folks were saying later for that. Um, th- it was all over the place, as it should be. We should not be monolithic, right? So, uh, it, it was, I mean, you saw every, in fact, what, one of the things that uh, the Criterion Collection does is you'll see some of the early reviews of Sweetback, you know, where there were some black folks who hated it, and black folks who loved it, and black so why didn't the guy in the toilet wash his hands before, you know, I mean, there's a lot of, sin. obviously there were some hygienic issues my brother had, I was like, oh my God, you know, I happen to be a hygiene freak, so I was like, oh man, don't, even, don't come anywhere near me with them hands. Um, so it was not seeing us as we were typically used to wanting to see ourselves, you know, which was sort of playing the piano nicely where Humphrey Bogart and, you know, you know, Bacall did something, we'd play the piano and look lossy. It was not that. Um, and it was, and the other thing was, it was starring the black community. So there's so many things that happened. <laughs> he couldn't use SAG actors. He wasn't gonna, he wasn't gonna play the role himself. And so he said, shit, I got to play the role. He went through the script and took out all the lines. So Sweetback doesn't say any lines. You know, he couldn't use union, union get folks, so he made it under the guise, like I said earlier, of doing a porn movie. So um, in every way, all, the community was, was, was fractured, but we start, were starting to have a real discussion with ourselves. And then, you know, Hollywood imitated the, flo- the formula, like I said. And the good thing about them imitating the formula was that they at least were now making us win. At least Pam Greer kicked some ass. Oh, let me tell you one quick story on that. This is really deep. <laughs> so, flash forward, I don't know, 30 years, and I'm doing, I'm doing a show. I think they had the Hudlins on. They had Fred Williamson on and my dad, and we're talking about 70s movies. And there was a white director from like Sweden or something, right? Young white director. And he, you know, I thought, what's this guy doing? He knew everything about black film. I was like, okay, 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 you got me, you got me. He was a complete cinephile. And we're talking, and and the Hudlins are smart, Warrington's, you know, my genius brother, and Fred had stuff to say, and Melvin, and we were going, it was really dope. You couldn't have kicked us out. We just kept having this conversation. At lunch, we're all sitting down, and the, the guy, the dude from Sweden sits down with us, and I could tell he had something to say. And he sits down and he proclaims, because Obama had just won, he proclaims, I knew there'd be a black president. And we were like, shut up. Get the fuck out of here. Get the fuck out Because none of us knew, because we were all talking about it. And he said, he said, I knew there'd be a black president. I said, okay. I said, he said, I'll tell you what. And he focused on me. He said, I'm going to take you to lunch anywhere you want. If I don't convince you that I knew there had been a black president, then I'll pay for lunch. You be the judge. But if I do convince you, you pay for it. I said, oh, we're going somewhere expensive then because it's a tall order. So we go to this restaurant and we sit down. The dude comes in. We sit down. He goes, all right. I was over in Sweden as a kid. And I, my first intro to movies where I saw a Pam Greer flick. I think it was Foxy, Foxy Brown or something. And I fell in love. I thought that Afro was a halo. 
And then I started looking at other films. I looked at Shaft, I looked at Superfly, I looked at your dad's films. I looked at every film I could find. And I said, I've got to go to America. I found Tamar Dobson. I've got to go to America and meet a sister like that. He came to America, brother had jungle, jungle fever, never dated a white woman, only dated the sisters, right? He said, man, I came here. I said, I've got to meet some sisters like that. Good Lord. So when he stayed with his family here in America, he said, I went into their room. These are my little blonde nephews and nieces. And they were sleeping under the posters of their heroes. And their heroes were on the wall, on the ceiling, were Michael Jordan, Michael Jackson, Prince. Their favorite show was The Cosby Show. I'm not talking about the, the man, I'm talking about the phenomenon. And he said, seeing those kids sleep under the pictures of their heroes, I knew there would be a generation of white kids too who could conceive of a black hero, and a black hero could be in the White House. And those kids in Iowa who grew up years after my dad did his movie would be able to never meet a black person and go, oh, I can conceive of the Huxtables in the White House and make them the Obamas. And he, he laid it all out. I said, okay, I'm buying lunch. <laughs> but the, the importance of imagery cannot be understated. They say this is not brain science. It is not. But it wires us to be, want to be the success we see. And I think that um, it, 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 it's, so, it, it's so important that we see more folks of color, more women, and I think especially now Native Americans. I haven't seen enough films by them. And they're the original folks here, man. So, yeah. But we need to see us all, all telling our stories. That's super important. And it's, it's just really, really healthy for us. And I try on my, you know, and here's the, the, the one last thing. And when I did, I did New Jack City, um, the producers were these, you know, brothers. They were brothers. And we had gotten the money from Warner Brothers. We got the money from Warner Brothers, and I'll have to stand up to tell you the story. So, go to Warner Brothers. I love this shit. I good to talk to you. So, <laughs> I go to Warner Brothers with the two producers, and we're walking into Warner Brothers to try to get, and I'd done a movie called Heartbreak Ridge with Clint Eastwood. So, the, Warner Brothers liked me. I'd made money for them, and Clint liked me, and he's a tall, cool Republican dude, and he adopted me, and so they said, he's cool, let, let Mario come in. So, take, I get to take the meeting with him. So, I'm walking into Warner Brothers, and the two producers stop me, and they go, Man, Mario, you're walking too tall. Don't walk that tall, okay? You got to walk a little more like this. And when they ask you how you're doing, you go, man, we struggling, man. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. We walk into the office. I thought they were bullshitting. The, the executive says, hey, how are you fellas doing? And the, and the two guys go, oh, man, we just struggling. I was like, what the hell? This is like, you know, 1990. What's going on? <laughs> but they, but. So we got the funding to make this movie. Then they said to me, you know, Mario, we had to talk. As soon as we got there, we got the check. We were like, oh, shit, we got it, we got it. So then, then they said to me, Mario, you know, in an action movie, in an action movie, if you're the black guy, you play, back then in the 90s, you play the police commissioner, right? Because they can say they're not racist because they put the black guy in a position of authority. But you don't get to shoot the gun or save the girl or you're not where the action is. That's like being in an X-rated movie and you ain't fucking, right? So you don't get to shoot your gun. You see what I'm saying? You don't get to shoot your gun. You kind of, and you got a hairline that starts back here so you're sort of past your sexual prime. And you know the lines they always say, that guy always says, do it by the book, I'ma have your ass. And you've seen a lot of great actors play the police commissioner, right? Okay, so now the guys came, the, the brothers came to me and said, yo, man, we could put the white dude in as the police commissioner and have him say, do it by the book or I'll have your tail. <laughs> we laughed. I went home. I looked at the family wall. On the family wall, I got my mom, who's white, my dad, who's black, my, fr my brother, who's part French, my gay aunt, my trumper aunt, some Asians, some Hispanic. We got every flavor in the world. And I laughed and I said, you know what, if I do that, that's going to be get even cinema. So I went back and I said, if we want kids to say no to drugs, you better have role models to say yes to. So we're going to get a sister, a dark-skinned sister, to play the prosecutor and take Nino Brown down, the gangster. We're going to get my buddy Judd Nelson, who's Jewish. From, I went to school with him at Stella Adler's over here. We'll call him. We'll get Russell Wong, who's Asian. We'll get Ice-T, who wants to play the gangster and make him play the cop with that street authenticity. And I'll play the guy who says, 
do it by the book or I'll have your ass. <laughs> and that's what we did. And what I, what, I wanted to sh what I wanted to say was that you could make film and make a hit without marginalizing anybody. And, and that was it. And same thing with Posse, then on and then on and then on. I think the advantage of growing up with Melvin was that I saw one person could make a difference. And of course, if we all turn on our lights, we bring the dawn. We can all make a difference. Thank you for coming. Yeah.